if you're a writer, there's so much you can learn from YouTubers. If you're a YouTuber, there's so much you can learn from podcasters. There's a lot that we can learn from each other, no matter what type of content we create or what platform that's on. And that's why I love these conversations with creators. In season two of Creators on Air, I learned so much. And in today's episode, I'm looking back on those lessons. Right before I kind of started my blog and then started writing, I read the book How to Take Smart Notes, which is now like a cultish book kind of online about Zettelkasten and and note-taking and all of that. And it is actually part of what I write about and what I teach people to do. But I, I feel lucky because I read it and I I started to take notes about everything. Um, and I think before that, you know, I was just a normal note taker, like highlight something, categorize it, like put it in some kind of quotes database, but not really look at it again. And so I just started kind of this practice, I called it the writing inbox practice, where if I was uh, if I was reading anything or consuming anything online, I um, saved it. I get like gave it a little. I call them breadcrumb notes. So like, it kind of reminds me like what what was I thinking or why did this kind of spark me? And then every morning I get up and I look into my writing inbox, which is all of those different breadcrumb notes, and I choose something to write about. Um, and not necessarily like something to publish, but just I just want to think and write. And that has been the biggest kind of inspiration driver for me. I feel like I started to really have knowledge rather than just Mm -hmm. have information and kind of a whole lot of stuff coming at me. Like I started to really um, kind of understand things and think through things and make sense of all the stuff that's coming in all all the time. And that really then gave me inspiration to write about things and um, publish something every day. If I'm telling stories to CEOs or I'm telling stories to students, it makes a whole lot of difference. So first of all, I think what really matters is being very empathetic and really feeling the pains and the gains, like actually in a marketing scenario, what does my reader need? What is he desiring? What is she craving for? What are her fears, anxieties, whatsoever? And once you know that, great. If you don't know it, talk to them. And I think this is a mistake what many people do. They start creating, which is great because they actually started. But then at some point, they are only thinking about their own thoughts and continuously sharing what they feel that is interesting instead of really talking to the people they are writing for. So what makes a good story? Definitely, first of all, know your audience. What also makes a good story is be very authentic, you know. I mean, there are topics I personally went through. I can definitely share my experience, but there are also certain things that I don't know, but I still want to write about. So what do I do? I don't claim myself as a wannabe expert. No, I I interview other experts. But what I really like about this is, and I see that many times that people don't do it, is I want to create a scenario where there's kind of a conflict. So instead of saying, oh, productivity is great, and this person A um, has studied um, productivity for years, and she has done that, to be honest, I can read that everywhere because there are so many productivity experts out there. But what makes the story very interesting is there maybe something that this guy does very different, or this girl, or this woman, um, to what you're expecting him or her to do. Or are there even two people who have a very different opinion? Can I maybe feature them both in my article? And also what I think makes the story very good if you have different resources. So even in the German press agency, there was never an article leaving our desk when you didn't commit to the rule, always ask three sources. So you have to ask three experts or you have to feature one study or it also has to be representative. If it's less than, I think, 1,300 people, then it doesn't say anything about our society. So that's very crucial. Um, So make sure you find maybe a pro or a contra person and put them in an article So for the conflict itself. Um, I think what also makes the story very good is um, that you are not overwhelming people with information. And 
again, I'm coming back to the question, what do you really want to say? And if you don't know what to say in one sentence, then your audience will not understand what you want to say in 20 pages, right? So I love the idea to focus on one argument and then create a story around it instead of saying, oh, I want to talk about productivity. No, challenge yourself. And this is the hardest part because most people, they just start writing and they have like a sort of idea, very blurry and oh yeah, maybe that could be a nice, but no, before you start, challenge yourself. So let's stay with the topic productivity. Okay, productivity. What is productivity? Okay, let's talk about um, routines. Okay, when is my routine? Okay, in the morning. Okay, why in the morning? Okay, because I'm a mother. Okay, why is that a challenge for me? Yeah, because I have a baby and I don't even have time for a routine or it's very hard to come up with a routine. Okay, and why do I need a routine? Okay, because I'm a self-employed mother who also has to work on her business. So I have only one hour to focus. So, you know, from productivity to how I invest my time very consciously being a mother and start um, juggling work and baby at the same time when I only have 60 minutes. This is how I move my business. So this is very, very concrete. And then I can dig into the topic itself. What really helps me? What do I really need? What's the challenge behind that? And are there any other mothers who have the same problems can i even interview and feature them and you realize that there's still so much content even if you narrowed it down so much but this is the key uh my opinion is that you know the best titles uh spark three emotions curiosity fear and or desire so usually it's like curiosity plus fear or curiosity plus desire um, and that's just like general terms that is what often gets people click is those three emotions my first nine months, uh, I was writing a weekly blog post and a weekly newsletter. And after nine months, because I, I, that's what I thought you were supposed to do. It was, you got to own your platform. You need to put your ideas there. And mm. nine months, I think I had 100 newsletter subscribers, something like that. Um, and I was getting you know 50 to 100 views on my blog posts. And I'd say 10 to 20 of them were my mom probably refreshing <laughs> and rereading it. Um, so very slow in the beginning and extremely frustrating because it was lonely. I didn't know whether I was doing anything wrong. I didn't have a community or a group of people surrounding me. I wasn't mm. getting any feedback on my ideas. So the first nine months, very slow and everything accelerated when I said, okay, I'm ready to give up uh, this whole writing on the internet thing, but I'm going to give it one more go. And instead of writing a weekly blog post on a blog, I'm going to write a week or a daily Twitter thread. So I had this routine of waking up in the morning, I'd listen to a podcast on a walk, I'd go about my full day at BlackRock. And then at the end of the day, I would summarize that podcast with everything I learned, three to five takeaways, something like that. And I did that for 30 days. And I still remember day 28, I hit publish. And after all this of, you know, there was some growth during that time, but day 28, I, I hit publish on a thread that got zero likes, zero retweets. It was like, I was back on my own blog. I was like, okay, mm. that's it. I'm giving up. Um, this is enough for me, but I wasn't one to quit early. I only had two days left. So the next day I wrote a similar thread, published it at around 6 30, 7 PM, shut my laptop, went to bed, woke up the next day and it went viral. I think it's to oh, this wow. day, one of my most viral four or 5,000 likes. I went from 500 to 2000 followers overnight. I went from, wow. so it took me nine months to get to 500 Twitter followers and then uh, 12 hours to go to 2000. <laughs> and uh, that's when I realized the power of you don't know what it is it's going to take off. And so you need to be putting ideas out there consistently. That was the foundation of Ship 30, which um, I know you took and you've had some others, Elise and Ev and Ollie uh, on the podcast as well, who are Ship 30 alums. But that was the foundation where I realized writing every single day and shipping something out into the world is really the most powerful thing you can do at this time uh, on the internet. And Ship 30 has been a way of getting that idea into as many people's daily kind of routine as possible. First, that YouTube channel, of course, if you hear someone buying a YouTube channel, 
most of the people will think of personality channels. Like, no way you can buy a channel where you have a big personality who's doing the videos, like a vlogger. You cannot really buy those type of channels and just put your face instead of Mr. Beast, for instance. It's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> so what it is, is the type of channel that I bought is a channel, what we called a YouTube faceless channel. So our, those are the channels where you hear a voiceover and you see images, but there's no personality. You don't see like a one hero shot of someone speaking. So those type of channels are easier to buy because nobody, like all the viewers, they won't know that the channel change ownership because they will still see the same type of images. For instance, so like to give you an idea, we can talk about like meditation channels or it's just music you hear like nice music on the, in the background <clears throat> and you have like a still image that is a channel that you can buy and you just reproduce the same type of video so putting meditation music with a nice background another type would be a news channel where you see <clears throat> for instance people talking about the world cup right you only see shots of the players and you just make a commentary of whatever's happening on the screen so you don't need to have a person on screen, right? You only do voiceovers. So that's the type of channel that I bought. But the type, the channel that I bought was doing, I mean, I won't, I cannot reveal <laughs> the channel name, but it's the type of channel that promotes products. For instance, if you're looking for a Christmas tree, you mm -hmm. will go online, mostly maybe on YouTube and type best Christmas tree to buy on Amazon. And one of my video might come up right or another those type of channel you will see like here are the uh, here are the best christmas tree for christmas 2022 and on that channel you will see um actually manufacturers videos showing you their product and so mm -hmm. what we do is just we put the manufacturers video <clears throat> so the promotional videos that the manufacturer did for their product and we just put one manufacturer then we put the other one then the other one then the other one and on top of that i have someone who write a script and just talk about those products so they're giving you they tell you fine this uh, christmas tree is great because the leaves don't fall or it's small enough to go into a studio so this is the type of voiceover that i have so this is the channel that i bought was doing that so it was easy for me to take over and um uh, to take over and make it grow one of the lessons that stoicism taught me is that there are some things in life you can control and there are other things that you can't control. And when I was a consumer, a pure consumer, I thought that most of my life I couldn't control. I thought I was going on the normal path and the normal trajectory was going to get a normal job. And that was what was my, my life was going to look like. But the more that I've made the switch from consumer to creator, and by the way, I think everyone's a creator to some degree and everyone's a consumer to some degree. It's just to what extent do you consume and create? But the more I've gone to the creator side of things, the more I realize that, ah, like, I can control where my life goes. I can control what happens with this one life that we have. And that's been the biggest mindset shift, realizing that I'm in control. I'm not just somebody who life is happening to me. I have some say in how my life turns out. I don't think there's really a need to set up a business because you can still like accept payments from brands. Um, you can do freelance work, like you can write off um, certain expenses, like kind of do all the normal business stuff without having a business. Um, but then like once you know that you're going to stick with it for a while or you have like pretty consistent income with it, um, then I think it makes sense to um, like set up an LLC or just depending on like what country you're in, like an official business entity. Um, because like with an LLC, like one of the biggest things you can do is get a business bank account. Um, and then that lets you just like kind of be more professional. You can like separate all your business expenses and your personal stuff. Um, whenever you're doing freelance work, like you can provide the, the client with like your business social security number, which is an EIN, instead of like giving your personal social out to like all your clients that you have to send those forms to. Um, and then just depending like how you set up the business, um, it can give you tax advantages, like just a normal LLC isn't going to be any different than if you didn't have a business, but if you choose to set up like an S corp or something, um, then you could save money on like self-employed taxes. Um, but for people just getting started, like there's not really a need to do it. Um, and it makes sense. Like once you know, you're going to be doing it for a while and you have pretty, pretty consistent income with it. Downloads doesn't necessarily mean listens.
Exactly. It just means that it's these devices have downloaded your episode, right? Yeah. Um, it's also addressable audience, right? So, like, if I'm talking about um, how to start a business, right? Lots of people want to start a business. That's why, um, like, smart passive income is so popular. Uh, that addressable audience is a lot bigger. If I'm talking about like underwater basket weaving, like that addressable audience is a lot smaller. And so I'm not going to tell that person like a thousand downloads is great when it's like an <laughs> audience of like 50. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's why downloads is tough. But, and and it could change. Right. Like, you know, from YouTube. Right. Like one video could just like absolutely be like the best thing you've ever done. And then the next video is a total flop for whatever mm -hmm. reason. Uh, and part of that is the algorithm, right? And there's no algorithm for podcasting. And so um, discovery is a little bit harder. But I think downloads, if you want sponsors, is like the is is the stat. Like it has to be the stat. Like that's what uh, that's what advertisers are going to want to look at. But I would I would say that if you want to measure how successful or how well your podcast is growing have a clear and consistent call to action and see how well that converts. So mm. at the beginning of my podcast, right. The, uh, for well, for my, my mini podcast, it's called make money podcasting. Uh, there's a pre-roll right in the beginning where I say real quick, before we get started, you're obviously interested in podcasting. I have this great resource called the podcast booster blueprint, which will help you get more downloads. Um, and then there's an opt-in, right? And so that on release days or the release, like first 48 hours, if I see more newsletter signups coming from that form, I'm like, hey, people are actually listening to this and it's great. Um, or if you say like, hey, review us on Apple Podcasts, right? And then reviews start coming in, great. You know you have an engaged audience. So I think that that is the, what I try to steer people towards, right? Because you want that, you know how engaged people are on YouTube. And you're a little bit at the mercy of the algorithm and you're at the mercy of the fact that like YouTube wants to keep people on YouTube mm -hmm. with podcasting. You have downloads, which is like a silly metric. Right. And like like views is kind of a silly metric on YouTube, too. Right. I'm like I'm, I'm on the verge of talking for too long. I'll stop in a second. No, um, there's no such thing. Because <laughs> <laughs> like what it's like. On YouTube, what is it? If someone watches for like 30 seconds or a minute, like they consider yeah. it a view. Like that's not a view. That's like yeah. you watch my intro. Um, Honestly, it's so true. Even comments aren't even that reliable because I'll have yeah. a comment and it's so obvious they've not watched the whole video. I'm like, you know, this does not tell me anything. Yeah. Hey, how do I do this? It's like literally the thing I cover in minute two of the video. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, um, yeah. So, so like downloads is kind of the same way. But the beautiful thing about podcasting is that the next step is not necessarily as obvious as YouTube. Like, like, subscribe, smash that whatever button, right? Make sure to click the bell for notifications. Like, that's what you want people to do on YouTube. You get to, t to define for podcasting what you want people to do next. So it could be join my mailing list. I personally think that's the best one. But it could be, hey, share this with a friend. Or tweet me what was your at me whatever mastodon me toot me is that what it's mm -hmm. called now whatever right um <laughs> uh reach out to me and let me know what you liked about this episode review us on apple podcasts um and and those are the things that if you start to see more people doing that based on your call to action which should be at the beginning and the end mm -hmm. um then you'll know like you you're building an engaged audience it's really common for people to to like the idea of a membership and launch it and underprice it not sell that many seats and so suddenly you're doing all the work of maintaining a community and, and maintaining a membership but it's not paying you all that much and it's really stressful because it's a lot of work and if you feel like all of this work isn't worth it you start to resent this thing it's difficult to back away from it so i spent like a good three months just designing what this would look like knowing that my audience were creators themselves, people who wanted to make this like a professional pursuit. And it really came down to like, okay, at what stage do I want to help people? What's the price point that makes sense for this so that uh, the size of it doesn't have to be big for it to be worthwhile and worth my time? Because I also didn't want it to be really big. And as you know, we capped membership at 200 total members. 
And so it was a lot of like playing around with numbers, honestly. I've been thinking about this so much lately um, because Ali Abdal, which, you know, put out a short from a podcast episode that I did with him when I was in London a few months ago. And the shorts short was named something like how Lana got to 1 million. Uh, and it was about how I'm journaling and I'm getting my ideas from that. And the majority of the comments on that short says she only got there because of the way that she looks. Oh, um, I hate that. So 90% of the comments. And there were some like loyal people who were like, actually, that's not enough. There's so much more legs into it. But so that really made me think a lot about what actually is it that makes someone successful on this platform and what are like the biggest contributing factors. And I realized that, and I made a video touching on this um, a few days ago, because there is such a broad range of creators on YouTube and everyone is so different. Like there are people who film all of their videos with their phone. They have crappy audio. Their videos are cutting off in random places and they're hugely successful. And then there are people who live in big mansions and they have, you know, a setup worth maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars and they're also very successful. So I think being able to answer like, what contributes to success on YouTube is quite an impossible question to answer, I think. I've come to realize at least. I don't think there is a secret formula. I think Ultimately, it's about a lot of people resonating with what you're doing, whether they're resonating because they, if it is appearance related, like they think you look cute, they want to look at you, that's the way to resonate, or you are talking to a part of them that they feel like they want someone to bring to the surface and that they want to get to know. There can be so many reasons. Um, so I don't know. That's a really good question. Like, why do people follow me? People have a very me, me, me focused mindset when it comes to sponsorship. So they think, oh, you know, I have this YouTube channel or I have this podcast or I have this web series or blog or whatever. How can I just go out and find sponsors to pay me? <laughs> that, mm -hmm. That's the mentality. I just, I'm getting all these views and like, how can I just find this brand who will just, I can like do a product placement or do a little shout out and like, they'll be super happy, right? Because it's, I'm getting all these views, right? And so as creators, we're very much in this kind of like, mindset where it's it's about performance it's about views it's about comments it's about engagement it's about performance relative to our last post all this stuff right um but the, the the cold truth of it is that brands don't care about any of that stuff for most of the time like a lot of times they have basically what they care about is their own marketing objectives mm. they don't know you they don't care about your channel whether you're getting millions of views whether you have millions of followers thousands they don't care they don't know you right and yeah. so what i what i coach people on is the most the most fundamental mindset shift in the beginning is how can you have a service mindset how can you go and think to yourself okay Yes, I'm getting lots of views, which is great. Yes, brands do care about that. But how can I illustrate to a prospective partner that I can help them accomplish their own marketing objectives by sponsoring me? Mm -hmm. So it's about them. It's about approaching it and saying, hey, I saw that you're trying to target the college student demographic to you know, try and get their first job. I can help you do that. You can reallocate some of the, you know, budget that you've already, you know, decided that you're going to spend towards this segment by sponsoring me. And so it's like, it's very much, it's it's accomplishing the same thing, but it's just a problem solution mindset, which is a very different thing. Everything I do as a creator is building my abilities to communicate. It's building technical skill. It's building business wisdom. And if I keep pushing in those directions, there's always going to be an opportunity the worst thing I could do is get addicted to my view counts and keep trying to make the same content forever mm -hmm. and not progress my own skills and not progress in my own discovery. Because eventually what I'm doing is going to get old. It's going to fall out of fashion. It's going to fall out of vogue. There's going to be new creators who come in who do it better than I did. They're going to have new ideas. They're going to be hungrier. That's where you do not want to stay. Um, so I think, you know, my, my path as a creator has been one of constant evolution and, um, and shifting who I talk to, what I talk about and, uh, what I've learned. So I've, I've learned a couple of key lessons. First and foremost, I'll say this for, for any creator, 
um, who experiences their first 10 out of 10 video in the YouTube studio. And for those who don't understand the YouTube studio, you think 10 out of 10 it sounds great, but it's, it means uh, out of the last 10 videos, it's 10th in terms of views. <laughs> so it's like, you're, you're washed up kid. Your chance is over. Hollywood has spit you out. Go back to the farm. And I've felt that many, many times. And I've gone through many, many cycles where I'll have like four or five videos in a row. They're all 10 out of 10s. I'm like, I'm washed up. I'm dead. Nobody cares about me anymore. And I've had so many creator friends go through the same exact experiences. And then next month they get a one out of 10. Next month they're doing great again. And I've been personally through this cycle at least four times. Yeah. Where I'm like four times. I'm out. I'm washed up. I got to go work as a lumberjack. That's been my backup <laughs> the entire time. Best get the flannel shirts, Tom. I'm literally <laughs> going through this cycle right now. <laughs> yeah. So my advice to you here is do not think that you've been washed up. This is this a, this a, this a sine wave, right? You're in the ebb and you're eventually going to get back to the flow because yep. maybe you take a little bit of a break or maybe you read a new book and you get ex- excited about something that's interesting and you're like, well, that's the thing I want to make. You know, and sometimes I've been here too. You get into a rut where you're like, got to make a video every week, got people to pay, mm. got sponsors that I got to appease. I don't really want to, but I guess I'm just going to make a video about this topic that I've already kind of made in the past. Let's make a video about document scanning apps, whatever. You know, it's like sometimes some videos I just wasn't excited to make, but it's like, I, I think it's a useful topic. I think, and yeah, I got a sponsor deadline. I got to do it. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. the other thing that I'll mention is, what I have chosen to do with my life in the past year is willingly give up a bigger audience. And that was scary to me. Like there was definitely a piece of me who was like, if I even leave my big channel for a month, am I going to fade into obscurity? And I have this huge asset here. Why would I not be using this? Yeah. And I'm going to go like work on this tiny channel on a piece of niche software that could go out of business anytime. Like what am I doing? Um, and it's been so interesting because number one, like I get to work on things that I'm much more excited to work on. People will call me a nerd for wanting to wake up and do formula documentation all day long. <laughs> and they are correct about that. I spent an entire day. I think the nerdiest one I did was spending an entire day doing the mathematical proofs in JavaScript to define the difference between modulus and, um, and remainder, which are different if there are negatives. But like some programming I didn't know engines what to say can't, to that. right? So yeah, so like, <laughs> there were days where I was super excited to wake up and wanted to do nothing but that. And that, that seems crazy. And like, well, you're such a nerd, Tom. Um, and here I am giving up this huge audience here and getting a thousand views on video. Sometimes the crazy thing though, is I don't think I've ever gotten more attention from media than I have in doing this. Like before this a business insider just interviewed me today, Freaking Patrick Rothfuss, the author of Name of the Wind, DM'd me on Twitter about Notion. The guy who wrote Enter the Spider-Verse followed me. My favorite animated movie ever. I'm like, holy crap. And I realize, like, just because you're getting big view counts or small view counts, that's not the only thing to be looking at because it's who is watching your content and what's doing for them. You know, is it 5 million people watching your video on the toilet because they just can't think of anything better to do? Or is it 20 people who all run Fortune 500 companies and they're deeply engaged in what you're saying and they want to bring you in and hire you? Like, which one of those is better? You ask, you know, I'll ask you. Um, I think my stance on that is pretty clear. So, yeah. and, and, and the other thing is I honestly have more fun being uh, a little less generally seen like when I had bigger view counts, I definitely would get recognized more. And I actually don't like that. Yeah. Uh, it's in my opinion, much more fun to be more well-respected in a smaller niche. Mm-hmm. Like you get to be famous sometimes, but then you get to be home and be like, True. nobody. thank you so much for joining me on season two of Grace and air. I'll definitely be back with more of your favorite creators, but let me know if there's anyone you'd love to have on air. And if you are a creator, check out Passion Fruit. We help you to do sponsorships without the hassle and we're building a pretty amazing community here. I'll see you soon.